I tell you, that's powerful. That's a word from God, even during receiving the offering. And I agree 100%. I've got a teaching entitled The Least of These based on Luke 16, 9, where Jesus said, if you don't trust God in this area of finances, if you can't do that which is least, then you can't do that which is greatest. And there are people that are believing for breakthroughs in their health and in their relationships and things like this, and yet you haven't done the least, which is trusting God with your money. Most people think, no, that's the greatest. Jesus said it was the least. If you can't do that which is least, you can't do that which is greatest. So man, that was a, that's a word from God. You could get set free through Ashley's offering uh, teaching. That's powerful. Jeremy, let me say thanks again. Man, that was so powerful today. It's awesome. I feel like the Lord has just supernaturally put this whole conference together. Everybody's teaching has uh, fit together. And if you haven't been inspired, touched in some way, you just weren't paying attention. Because I guarantee you, God has been here. The Lord has been touching people's lives and uh, I just encourage you to really place value on it. You know, I've got a teaching that is based on Romans 1, 20. I'm not going to teach on that right now, but it talks about things that we have to do to deaden ourselves to what God is doing. And the first thing is it says they didn't glorify God. And I looked that up and glorify means to place value worth on. If you don't value what God has done in your life, Satan comes and steals it away. And I'm just telling you that uh, I believe that this has been a supernatural time together. I believe that God has orchestrated it and you need to place value on it. You need to do that. You're the one that places value on everything. You know, I actually have had some people come to me before and talk about what their mate has said about them and they're just brokenhearted and crying and telling me how bad it is. And I said, your mate could come and say those exact same things to me and it wouldn't affect me at all. And they just said, well, of course not. That's not your mate. And I said, you're the one that placed the value on that. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't love your mate and want to get along, but you ought to place so much value on God that in relation, in comparison to what God says, it just doesn't do anything. If somebody is bothering you, you're the one that placed the value on them and said, I can't live without their approval. And so you need to... Uh, value what God has done. And if you will do it, I guarantee you, uh, you'll leave this place better off. And I believe you're going to be a blessing. Not only will you be blessed, but you'll be a blessing to other people. So I just want to follow up what I started with on um, Thursday night. And this is the 55th anniversary of when the Lord really changed my life. It was 65 years ago when I got born again, but 55 years ago when I really encountered the Lord, that's what I was talking about. And I talked about it's all revelation from God. It's, it's uh, things that God has shown me that has changed my life. And so the first thing we talked about was I got a revelation of hell, that I needed salvation. I got a re revelation of salvation, that it wasn't based on me being good or bad. It was just a matter of receiving what Jesus did. And then I talked about that night on March the 23rd, 1968, where I got a revelation of my pride and how I was trusting in myself. And man, I was just sitting here thinking as Jeremy was teaching today that, thank you, Jesus, that this is the way he started touching me. He, he gave me a revelation of my relative unworthiness. And you know, a lot of faith people, uh, they won't even admit that there's anything unworthy. No, I'm the righteousness of God. Well, that's absolutely true in your spirit, but your flesh is not worthy. Your soul is not yet where it needs to be. And I tell you, until you submit and yield yourself to God and recognize that, you know, just like that centurion is saying, I'm not worthy of these things. I'm asking it because of your great love, because of your grace and mercy. Man, God resists. I love that. What, what did you say? It's not, you set yourself against when God resists, it's setting himself against like an army. What? arrayed in battle against. And it's because we are still promoting and trusting in our own self that we find God opposed to us. He's not really opposed to you, but he is not going to promote pride and arrogancy. 
You know, I've got uh, 1,100 employees and I try and go around and say hi to them uh, every day. Then I'm here, of course, there's, there's 800 and something that are here, the others are around the world. But as much as I can, I go around and talk to them. And so I get to interact with a lot of employees and I love them all. I'm not against anybody. But you know, I see people that have attitudes that I'm not gonna promote. And when it's time for somebody to rise up, I guarantee you, I am not, I'm not against anybody, but I am not gonna promote a person with a bad attitude that is gonna wind up causing me problems because they haven't learned how to deal with things yet. And so I, that's the way that I look at it. God loves us. He wants to prosper you, but God's not gonna promote you if you've got a bad attitude. He resists the proud. And so this is a necessary thing. So that's what I've already talked about, but I want to go on and talk about some other things. And man, I've got a list. I'm just starting this. I just started last week writing a little thing about this and I've already got about 15 or 16 major revelations and I'm not even into the nineties yet. And so there's a lot of things, but let me just point out some things that that night when the Lord showed me what a Pharisee I was and I humbled myself and repented and ask God to forgive me. I honestly was expecting some form of rejection because this is what I'd been taught that God loved us and moved in our life based on our performance. And when I finally realized that my performance stunk and that I didn't deserve anything from God, I was actually expecting some form of rejection and yet it was just the opposite. I mean, uh, after an hour and a half of me turning myself inside out, and I hadn't done that many outward things, but Jesus said, if you're guilty in your heart of lusting, you've committed adultery. If you're angry without a cause, you're guilty of murder. And so I started confessing the things that I was thinking and I was naming names. And these were all of my friends in this prayer meeting. Any reputation I ever had, I ruined it. And after an hour and a half, I was just laying there. I had nothing left to say and I was waiting to see what God was going to do. And instead of rejection or punishment, I had a supernatural, tangible love of God that just flowed over me. It wasn't just my mind making an adjustment and recognizing that God loved. I felt it. I mean, I was caught up in the presence of God for four and a half months I never slept more than an hour at a time for four and a half months. I never sat down and ate a meal. I was so excited. I couldn't sit long enough to eat. I would eat something, but I would just grab something and go. And I was, I was just caught up in the presence of God. It literally revolutionized and transformed my life. And through that, because I was at my lowest and finally realized for the first time in my life that I didn't deserve anything from God, it was just automatically understood that God's love for me had nothing to do with me. He didn't love me because I was lovely. He loved me because he was love. And man, I can't tell you how that revolutionized my life because my whole life I've always believed in God. I've always been seeking God, but I was trying to do something to earn his favor in my life. And you can't do enough. I remember one time reading, uh, I started in Mark and read all the way from Mark through Revelation in one day. I fasted all day long and I spent, I think it was 15 or 16 hours reading and studying. And man, when I went to bed, I was thinking, I have really done something and I was really pleased with myself. And then I thought, I was awake 17 hours. I wasted an hour and I wound up going to bed condemned over I could have done more. Did you know you can never do enough? Those of you that maybe have come out of some things and now you're seeking the Lord and doing better than you've done in the past and you think if I could just do a little bit more, if I could be a little bit holier, I know God's gonna move in my life. I'm telling you, I've already lived holier than you've ever thought about living and it didn't work for me. <laughs> It's not going to work for you. You need to get off that treadmill. You're going nowhere. 
and recognize that God's love is absolutely unconditional towards you. Now, there are things that you do that affect whether you receive that revelation or not. And this is what Jeremy was talking about. It's what all of us have been talking about. If you don't humble yourself and come under, as long as you are still in pride and you are still promoting and, and, and thinking that God owes you something, well, that will definitely hinder you receiving the love of God. Because if you tie God's love to you, your heart is always going to tell you that you are not worthy of it. And the truth is you aren't worthy of it. But the good news is God's love isn't conditional on your performance. So I got a revelation of that by experience. And I could just, I could spend literally weeks just talking about the unconditional love of God. But that was a major revelation. But I need to go on and say this. Another revelation that God began to give me was when I got in Vietnam, the emotion of that experience had worn off. And man, I've got so much I'd love to say. I'd love to tell you everything I know. That's the reason I've got 200,000 hours of free teaching on our website. 200,000 hours. If you listen 24 hours a day, it would take you 22 years to go through all of that. If you only listen eight hours a day, it'd be 66 years for you to go through that. That's no exaggeration and that's all free stuff. So anyway, I'm condensing this a lot. But if all I would have had was that experience of experiencing God's love, I praise God for it. I'm not criticizing that at all. I thank God for lighting a fire on the inside of me. But if that's all I would have had, you'd have never seen me. I'd have, I wouldn't be a minister today. You cannot sustain an emotional high like that. And I know some people, this is confusing because this is what you're after. If I could somehow or another say, come up here and I'm going to lay hands on you and you will experience what I experienced back in 1968. I guarantee you we could, we would have the vast majority, nearly every person in here. Everybody's looking. They want somebody to lay hands on them and do something for them. But you know what? You can't sustain that. And once I got into Vietnam and the emotion had worn off of this, desperation sat in. Not because of what was happening in Vietnam, but I had tasted what God was like and I didn't know what I did to make it happen. I didn't know what I did to make it leave. And I mean, I started panicking and I, I started fasting. I didn't know anything about anything when I was over there. And I remember in 120 degree heat, going uh, three days without any food or water. <clears throat> I didn't know that you needed to at least drink water. 120 degrees, I nearly died. I had to crawl to the mess hall. I nearly killed myself. But man, I was fasting. I was doing anything I could do to try and do something to get God's love to come back. And I was perplexed. I knew that God loved me. I'd experienced it, but I couldn't understand. God, how could you love somebody like me? And let me say it this way, that unless you get revelation, unless you understand whatever you experience from God, you will lose if you don't get the knowledge that enables you to maintain it. Life is sustained. It says over in 2 Peter chapter 1, all things that pertain unto life and godliness are given unto us through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. It doesn't matter how, what you experience. It doesn't matter if you see a great healing in your life. If you come here and, and praise and worship and God speaks something and you get touched, those things are great and praise God for it. But, the, but I guarantee you a month from now, a year from now, it's not going to be some feeling, some encounter that you had that's going to change your life. It's going to be the truth that sets you free. It's going to be revelation knowledge. And so I was saying, God, how could you love me? And the thing that began to change my life, and in a way, I'm going to do a disservice to this because I don't have time to go into explanation, but I just happened to have a book on this entitled Spirit, Soul, and Body, which is, is what the Lord revealed to me. And it came through 2 Corinthians. I'm going to talk as fast as I can to get as much in as I can. So please go and get the books and and the recordings of this and go study it on your own. But I was reading in Vietnam 
And I came to that verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Wherefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And I read that and I was just saying, God, I know I'm born again. I know that I have a relationship with you, but old things haven't passed away in my life. I was an, I was an extreme introvert. I couldn't look at a person and talk to them. I couldn't look you in the face. To do something like this, it would have killed me. I just could not do this. And I had fear of man. I was timid. I was shy. Uh, I just, you know, it wasn't going out and doing drugs and uh, things like that, but I was just constantly failing to be the person that I knew that God wanted to me be. And yet that verse said that if you're in Christ, you're a new creature. And I couldn't understand it. And I said, God, how do I put what I'm experiencing with what the word says about me? And the Lord led me to 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, where he prayed a prayer. And he says, I pray God that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord. And when I read that, I, th I thought spirit and soul were the same thing. Matter of fact, if you read in Strong's Concordance, he will define the word um, pneuma that is used for spirit in the New Testament. He defines it, or excuse me, he defines soul as the, um, what is he, I don't know what I'm saying. He defines soul. Anyway, the point I'm trying to get across is he says that soul and spirit are the same thing. And this is the way that most people look at it, that soul and spirit are the same thing, but they aren't. It right there in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body. And it just dawned on me that there was a third part to me that I didn't know anything about. I knew my physical body and I knew my mental and emotional part that the Bible calls your soul. I was aware of that and I was in tune with that, but the Bible said there was a third part of me and it just dawned on me. It was the spirit that got born again, that old things have passed away and all things have become new. And so I started a crash course trying to find out who I was in Christ. I put that together with John chapter four, verse 24, where it says that God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And my problems that I was having was that I was trying to come before God in my body, in my flesh, in my soul and say, God, I've now done this. I, I'm doing this. I'm studying more than I ever have. Now am I accepted? I was approaching him in the flesh instead of in the spirit because in the spirit, I'm, old things have already passed away. All things have become new. And in the spirit, I'm identical to Jesus. First John chapter four, verse 17. I can't tell you how important this revelation was to me. It might come differently for different people, but this allowed the whole word of God to start making sense where it said that Christ is in you. And I'd go look in the mirror and I couldn't see Christ in me. But it's not in my body. It's not in my soulish realm. It's in my spirit that Christ is in me. And I begin to start relating to God spirit to spirit. And I tell you, it just transformed me. It set me free. I found out that I was already free. I was trying to get free, but I found out I was already free. In my spirit, I was, I was already free. And the scripture says, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And again, I've got, I couldn't even tell you, but really everything I teach is based on that one revelation. I had an experience that got my attention, that gave me a taste of something that was greater than anything I had ever experienced, but I am not living off of an experience. I'm living off of a revelation of what Jesus has done in my life. And that's what transformed me. And everything I teach comes out of of this. My whole life comes out of who I am in Christ and it has revolutionized me. I could spend weeks, weeks talking about that. But I also want to mention that another revelation I began to get was that the way God gives these revelations and everything happens is through the word of God. I began to start seeing the absolute essential role that the word of God pay, plays in my life. I remember my very first week in Vietnam, 
Uh, I won't go through this whole thing, but in the United States, I had a really, really, really bad encounter with CS gas. I nearly died. I came close to dying. And I had such a bad encounter that when we were in Vietnam the very first week, they were going to put us through this gas chamber and gas us. And I was, I said, God, I'll do anything. I'll do anything, but I cannot go through this gas thing again. And so at breakfast, they asked for volunteers. And man, you just don't volunteer in the army, you know, but I, I figured if they used me for target practice, that would be better than going through this gas chamber. So I was the first one with my hand up and it turned out what they wanted me to do was to be a bunker guard. While everybody else went through the gas chamber, I was laying on the bunk, just watching everybody's stuff so that nobody stole things. It was awesome. And so... I was reading in Mark chapter four and I read, uh, you know, uh, about this uh, mustard seed that is the smallest of all seeds, but when it's planted, it grows and becomes the biggest of all of the herb bearing trees. And I was reading that out of Mark chapter four, I believe it's verse 29 and, or maybe 30 and 31. And I was reading that and I was saying, God, this is what I want. I want you to live in me in such a way that, man, I become this powerful force that people from all over the world could receive and benefit from what you're doing in my life. And as I was praying that, the Lord just spoke to me and he said, Andrew, he says, if I was to grant your answer to prayer and give you that kind of influence, the first bird that landed on a branch would knock the whole tree over the first puff of wind would uproot it. He says, your root is about that deep. And he says, the reason I'm not giving you this opportunity and haven't opened up doors is because you can't sustain it. It would destroy you. And he says, you just stick your nose in the word and you get rooted in the word. And he says, as you're able to handle it, I'll give you influence and I'll touch people and stuff. And that became a focus of my whole life. When I was in Vietnam, I spent 10 to 15 hours every day just studying the Word. And I didn't understand a lot of it, but you know, when you first start in the Word, you've got to lay a foundation before you can start getting all of these other things. And so a lot of it is just putting information in. I just poured through the Word of God. And then God began to start showing me things. Let me turn over and take time to just share one thing with you out of Mark chapter four. And this, I had this revelation back 45 years ago, but I'm getting greater understanding of it. And this is just a great way of saying the point I'm trying to make right here. I've got a book entitled Effortless Change that will go into this. I've got a brand new little booklet out uh, entitled Plain is Dirt. I tell you what, that is one awesome teaching. Amen. I had a guy come up one time and tell me, he says, you are plain as dirt. And he wasn't using that as a compliment. <laughs> but I have learned that, man, that is about the greatest compliment you could give anybody. And people think, why is that? Look at this in Mark chapter four, in verse 26, he said, so is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how for the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. And when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle because the harvest is come. And there's a lot I could say out of this, but this is talking about the word of God and how it works in your life. He is making a comparison that the kingdom of God is dependent upon the word of God, the way that this physical world is dependent upon seeds. And many people don't give a much thought to this, but there isn't life on this planet without seeds. You know, we have become so detached from the way things used to be. We now go to the grocery store and there's a lot of people that think that their food comes from the grocery store, but it really came out of the ground. It grew out of the ground and if it's an animal, a seed was planted. You are a result of a seed. Life doesn't exist on this planet without seeds. And in the same thing, life in the kingdom of God doesn't exist without the seed of God's word. 
First Peter chapter one, verse 23 says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed by the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. The, and if you look those words up, that word for seed is spora, where we talk about a spore. You know, a flower is pollinated by the spores being spread. And spora is a derivative of the word sperma, where we get the word sperm from. You can't have a birth without a seed being sown. Did you know even the virgin birth had a seed sown? The word was the seed. And that's the reason that the Bible says that the word became flesh. God took all of the prophecies about Jesus and the Holy Spirit took the word and impregnated Mary. This word became flesh. Even the virgin birth was based on this principle of a seed. It just wasn't the seed of a man. It was the word of God. And so the word is the seed here. And it says you just plant it and you sleep and rise night and day. That shows that there's length of time involved. And then it says, and the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. Notice it didn't say that the seed brings forth fruit. The seed doesn't produce fruit. The earth brings forth fruit. The seed activates what's in the ground. When God created the heavens and the earth, he said, let the earth bring forth trees, grass. Let the earth bring forth animals. Did you know that when God created dirt, in the dirt was every plant, every tree, every animal that exists on this planet was in the dirt. Elephants were in the dirt. Giraffes, dogs, cats, Everything, every plant, every tree, it's all in the dirt. Dirt is miraculous. That's the reason it's a compliment when somebody says, your plane is dirt. <laughs> dirt is miraculous. If you don't believe that, take a seed and plant it in dirt that has been uh, overworked, you know, and it's lost all of its nutrients or something has happened. I guarantee you that seed won't do a thing. When you plant an acorn, an acorn doesn't produce an oak tree. An acorn activates the ground. That oak tree is already in the ground and the, the seed just activates the ground and it's the earth that brings forth fruit. Notice the terminology of herself, feminine. The earth is feminine. The word is masculine. It's a seed. That seed sown in the earth makes the earth, you know, a woman, this is the reason that, uh, it says that a, um, man is the one who produces the child. A woman receives the seed. She can't produce the, uh, conception. The man is the one who gives the seed. The woman conceives and receives in a spiritual sense, you can't make anything happen. You have all of the potential, but you need the seed of God's word to come to you to make that conception take place. And then the born again spirit. I was referring to this earlier that see in the spirit, you're already complete. First John chapter four, verse 17, as he is, so are we in this world. In your spirit, you've got everything. You've already got healing. You've got the same power that raised Christ from the dead in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. You've already got the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2, 16. You've already passed from death unto life and on and on. Your spirit is perfect. Anything you will ever need, you've already got it in your spirit, but you've got to have a seed that activates that and then this will come out. So the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. Did you know that phrase uh, of herself is the Greek word automatos? It's a word we get automatic, automatically from. You take the seed of God's word and if you sow it in your heart, not just in your intellect, but you, you get it in your heart, you embrace it with your heart, you let the word of God come real in your heart and a conception takes place. And it's just a matter of time. Automatically, you are going to see healing come. You're going to see prosperity come. You're going to see deliverance come. You will see vision come. You will see anything that you need. This is one of the principles that God 
began to teach me. And man, I just started pouring myself into the Word of God. And I still do it. If I have time, I'll spend five, ten hours a day studying the Word. I still love studying the Word as much as anything. I don't have as much time now to do that, but as much time as I have, I just spend huge amounts of time studying the Word. I don't know Jeremy, but I can guarantee you from the things he teaches, he does the exact same thing. You don't get the revelation that he's got by just listening to somebody else. He's studying the Word. And so you take the Word of God and you put it in your heart and it just transforms you. That's what this book I've got entitled, Effortless Change. People talk about it's just so hard to change. That's because you're trying to change in a way that God didn't ordain. You're asking God to heal you and you're begging him and you're fasting and you're having people lay hands on you until they rub all the hair off your head. You go through all of these things. You'll follow people to another conference. You'll do all that, but you won't take the seed of God's word. If you take the seed of God's word and if you meditated on all of the healing scriptures day and night and you put it in your heart, it would be impossible for you to stay sick. But if you're trying to get the results outside of the word, well then yeah, change is traumatic. It's hard. But you know, you take a little apple seed and you plant it in the ground. That thing just, the ground, it's just the nature of the ground. You put a seed in the ground and if the temperature is right and if the moisture is right, that ground will just automatically take that seed and begin to break it down and start releasing the life that's in it. And pretty soon that apple tree will come out. And you've never seen an apple tree just sit there and shake and groan and yell, Ugh! and here's an apple. It's just the nature. It just works. You would have automatic healing. You would have automatic blessing and prosperity, joy and peace if you kept your mind stayed upon the Word of God. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, the Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him because he trusteth in him. If you just were to meditate in the Word, there's not a problem that you have that would not be changed. But notice it says he sleeps and rises night and day. That implies that there's growth to this. See, most people aren't wanting to commit themselves totally to God and to his word. They're wanting to come to a conference and have somebody just wave their hand over you. Jeremy was making great points about Naaman just wanting uh, Elisha to wave his hand over him. This is what's still happening. You just come and you get in the word and you do all of this and then you produce the fruit for me. You know, again, there is a balance here because some people are in a desperate situation and they hadn't got five years to grow. And you may have to go to somebody who has been in the word and draw on their anointing to help you temporarily, but it is wrong to substitute that for your own growth. God never intended for ministers to be a substitute. Jeremy made a great point about that, that the five-fold ministry is for the perfecting of the saints so that you can do the work of the ministry. And yet as a whole, the body of Christ is still depending upon just a few people and thinking that they're the one that has the anointing. Our whole Karis Bible College is trying to get you to receive. You know, I had two people come up this last week and they were saying could we have more impartation where we just come and you lay hands on us and prophesy over us? And you know, I'm not saying that we have a perfect balance. I'm not claiming that. We're still growing and learning and Karis has changed a lot and I'm sure it'll still change a lot. But in the very beginning, we did do that a lot more. Matter of fact, I was in one class and I remember just telling the people, I said, you don't have to wait on an anointing to come. Some people will say, here's the Holy Spirit. And then uh, you know, they say, well, the anointing lifted and so I can't pray for you anymore. God's not like that. The anointing doesn't come and go. Now, the manifestation of God's power and anointing does come and go, but that's based on us. Lots of times people get tired after praying for people for two or three hours and say the anointing left and what it is, their strength left. God doesn't ever wear out. He never gives up. So anyway, I was telling the people, I said, look, you don't have to wait on, you know, the music to be perfect and things to happen. I said, I can prophesy to anybody, anytime. Now, again, it's limited on what gifts God has given you, but I have a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge and prophecy, and I can prophesy over anybody. And they were saying, you cannot. And I said, yeah, I can too. They said, prove it. 
And so I took the first row. There was five or six people. And I said, all right, let's just pray. And I went down the row and I just started prophesying. And I mean, it was amazing the specific words that were coming. And when I opened my eyes, the whole class was up here wanting prophecy. And then they told the other classes and we canceled the whole day's program. And I prophesied to people for four hours and we saw healings and great things happen. And that's good. And I'm not saying that there's not a place for that. But I just, my passion is not to make you dependent upon me prophesying over you. I'm trying to teach you the things that God has spoken to me so that you can bypass me and go directly to God. I've got an expiration date on me. I'm not going to be around forever. And this is what Karis is all about is trying to teach people these things. God is no respecter of persons. Romans 2, 11, the same things that have worked in my life and that God has changed me, it'll work for any person in here. All of our dirt is identical. In the spirit, you are identical to me. You are identical to Jesus. You've got everything. In the spirit, we are complete. The only difference between us is the renewing of our mind and how much we are operating in the revelation, how much we're yielding, submitting, like what Jeremy was saying, and letting God live through us instead of us living and trying to get God to bless our efforts. That's the only difference between any of us in here. But I guarantee you, every man in here, you have the exact same potential that Jesus has. That's the reason he said in John 14, 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. God has given every one of us identical born-again spirits. Now, you may have a different anointing or calling to use it in a different way, but we're all identical in the spirit. Every one of us can see the dead raised, the blind eyes open. Every one of you can hear the voice of God. There is no difference in our spirits. The only difference is in our soulish and physical realm, the degree to which we submit and yield to God and allow him to live through us. If what I'm saying is true, well then man, you ought to just commit yourself to renewing your mind and releasing the life of God that's on the inside of you. And man, you not only need it for yourself, but all of the people around you, your family, the people that you work with, the people in your church, they need you to start manifesting this power. And so this was another revelation that just transformed me. I realized that there was zero difference between me and the person that I respected the most. The only difference, it wasn't in my spirit. It was just how much I had yielded to it, whether or not I knew and understand these truths. And so I began to start putting myself into the word of God and I'm running out of time. So let me just say some other things quickly. There's so many things. I'd love to share with you, but on that experience that I had, March the 23rd, 1968, I didn't realize it at the time, but that was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I didn't speak in tongues that night because I was a Baptist. And I'd been told that this was of the devil. And God doesn't force you to speak in tongues. It's very similar to the way I'm ministering. You know, I asked God to speak through me, but if I was just to say, oh God, don't let it be me, let it be you. And so if I said, speak through me, and then I open up my mouth and just stick my tongue out and wait on God to make me talk, nothing would ever be said. This is me talking. That's where it comes out in Texan. It's me talking, but I believe that God inspires it. That's exactly what the Bible says in Acts 2, 4. They spoke with tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance or the inspiration. You have to speak in tongues. The Holy Spirit doesn't speak in tongues. He inspires you. You have to speak. And so I'd been taught that this was of the devil and God didn't force me to do it. But I guarantee you in hindsight, looking back, that's what happened. I was filled with the Holy Spirit, the love of God. And it was three and a half years later when I got back from Vietnam and a friend of mine, uh, Joe Nay, who uh, Jeremy knew Joe Nay. Joe Nay at one time was an associate with Kenneth Copeland for just a brief period of time. Kenneth gave him one of his airplanes. And Joe Nay, when I got back from Vietnam, had uh, been hanging around Kenneth Copeland. 
And he came over and he told me, he says, what we experienced that night was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he says, that's what you got. And I had been reading about it and I had come to realize that speaking in tongues, even though I taught it was of the devil, I, I came to realize it was real, but I was, I was praying for it, but I was just waiting on God to make me speak in tongues. And anyway, uh, Joe helped me get over that. You know, this is another piece of inf interesting information. I'll say this for Jeremy, but when I got out of Vietnam, I got out uh, the last day of February of 1971 is when I came back to the States. And in March, so that would have been, how many years ago was that? 52 years ago this month, Joe took me over to uh, uh, Brother Nichols Church in Fort Worth. Not Bob Nichols, but the other Nichols. And, uh, and Kenneth was speaking. And I was a Baptist guy. I'd never been anywhere but a Baptist church. And I heard Kenneth speak and it lit a fire on the inside of me. And many of you are going to think I'm lying, but before God, I'm telling you the truth. I got so excited. I ran around that church screaming. I made multiple circles around that church. I don't think I've ever done it since. But I was running and screaming, thinking, man, this is awesome. It just lit a fire on the inside of me. And anyway, I began to recognize that that's what had happened, but it wasn't going to be complete until I prayed in tongues. But when you pray in tongues, is is kind of like releasing. It's like when you pray in tongues, you flip a switch and you have the power of the Holy Spirit. But when you pray in tongues, you activate it. You, it's like turning that dynamo on the inside of you on. And I began to start seeking for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I already had that, but I was praying for speaking in tongues. And it's a long story, but finally... I was able to start speaking in tongues. And man, you talk about another revelation. And so much of the word that I understand comes from speaking in tongues. The Bible says that when you pray in tongues, it's your spirit praying. 1 Corinthians 14, 14. And then it says in verse 13, it says, if you pray in tongues, pray also that you interpret. And did you know you can interpret when you're praying in tongues, 1 Corinthians 14, 4 says it's your spirit praying and it's, uh, you're praying the hidden wisdom of God. And so you're speaking the wisdom of God in your spirit. 1 uh, Corinthians 2, 16 says you have the mind of Christ. Colossians 3, 10, put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of the him that created him. First uh, John chapter two, verse 20, you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. Some people think, man, I don't know all things. It's not talking about up here. In your spirit, you know all things. You have perfect revelation. Nothing that Jeremy has said, E.W., myself, anything that we have said, you know those things in your spirit. And that's sometimes what happens when you hear something and you say, man, I knew that. That's your spirit bearing witness with this. Your spirit knows all truth. But how do you get it out of your spirit? Praying in tongues. When you are praying in tongues, you're praying this hidden wisdom of God. And then all you got to do is pray that you interpret. And it doesn't have to stop and do a word for word interpretation. It's just you start praying in tongues and all of a sudden you start seeing things. And what I did, man, I was steeped in Baptist religion. And when I started reading things and it was contrary to what I'd been taught I remember many times just taking a scripture and sitting there and looking at it and start praying in tongues and say, God, show me what is the, how do these things reconcile, harmonize? And so much of everything that God has shown me has come through praying in tongues and asking God to give me revelation. I tell you, brothers, if you don't have the ability to pray in tongues, you need it. It's not just something you do one time to prove to yourself that you've received the Holy Spirit. And sad to say, too many people do that. They will press through and pray and speak in tongues and then they may not speak in tongues for another year. Man, that's not what it's about. Speaking in tongues, Paul said, I speak in tongues more than ye all. And he was talking to the whole body of Christ. That would be like me saying, I pray in tongues more than all of you put together. That's what Paul was saying. And it just so happened that he wrote half of the New Testament. 
And I believe that one of the ways he got that revelation, he said over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I'm speaking the wisdom of God, but it's in a mystery. And then 1 Corinthians 14, 2 or 4, it says that when you're praying in tongue, you're praying the mysteries of God. Where did he get the interpretation, the understanding of the mysteries? He knew the word already as being a student of Gamaliel. He had studied the word. He could quote the first five books of the Bible. He knew the word, but he got the revelation of grace through praying in tongues and asking for an interpretation. There needs to be balance on that. You don't just pray in tongues and take the first thing that comes to you. Nothing that God will ever show you will ever violate this word. This is the plumb line. But uh, nonetheless, that principle exists. Man, if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues, I tell you, it's like charging hell with a dry water pistol. You need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You need speaking in tongues. And I could just go on and on and on talking about all of those things. But those are some of the foundational things that God did in my life. And I tell you, that's, that's not just for me. This isn't just for a minister. Every one of us is supposed to be living in this. And again, this is the whole thrust of my ministry is not trying to get everybody to come to me, but I'm trying to teach these truths to other people so that you can take this. And you know, someday I'm not gonna be here. And I heard a man say that if you are drawing everybody to you and if everybody has to be dependent upon you praying for them, then you ultimately are going to be a failure because someday I'm going to be gone. What we're trying to do is to disciple people. And man, I just love it. I was watching Ashley up here and thinking, man, what a blessing to be a part of speaking into his life and now see him out there doing exploits and doing things. And just so many people I could point to. Man, this is what excites me. You, when I first was young in the Lord, I wanted to see blind eyes open and deaf ears open because I had never seen it and I wanted to prove to myself that it could happen. And I still enjoy, we've saw a lot of miracles. I saw people that were right here that weren't able to move, having pain and things, and they've been healed this week. And I still enjoy seeing it. But you know, I get more blessing out of seeing some of these people that we've taught the Word of God come lay hands on people. I'd rather see that. I'd rather see somebody else raise a person from the dead than me do it. We had a little baby that was raised from the dead right here. A woman came forward and put a 14-month-old baby right there and it had died. And you were here, Ashley, weren't you? Were you holding that baby? I was standing up here and Carly, his wife, was holding in Daniel Amstutz and I think there was a couple of others. And so we were all praying, but I wasn't the one doing the praying. It was people that I had been teaching the word and that they took the baby and they prayed. And this baby was just totally limp. There was no breath. It had already changed colors. And all of a sudden, as we prayed, this baby just jerked. And man, its arms come up like this and opens its eyes, raised from the dead right here in this spot. And I didn't do it. Of course, whoever else was praying didn't do it either. It was God that did it, but I'm not the one that he used. He used somebody else. And I would rather see that. I tell you, I'm just, I'm praying that you catch a vision of what we've been trying to say here that man, God loves you. He loves you because he is love, not because you're lovely. There is no such thing as a dud from God's standpoint. God has great plans for every one of us and he wants every one of you to be absolutely living a, life, a miraculous life, manifesting the power of God. There's nobody who's just a placeholder. God has great plans for you, but it's not gonna come by you just praying and begging and, and need it's going to come by you taking the seed of God's word and planting it in your heart and getting revelation. And then as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 23, 7. Your life is the way it is because of the way you think. I'm not saying it's the way you desire it to be. You may hate the way it is, but it is the way it is because of your thoughts. If you want to change your circumstances, change your thoughts, change your heart. Change comes from the inside out. 
It doesn't come. I could pray for you and I might get you to have an experience, but that experience won't last. What happened to me in 1968, it was over in four and a half months as far as the feeling and the emotion of it. And if I hadn't gotten into the Word and begun to renew my mind, I guarantee you I would not be here today. I'm not do, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. It's the Word of God that has made any difference in my life. And God is no respecter of persons. He'll do it for every one of you. Amen. So this is what this men's advance has all been about. We've come here and we've shared the Word of God and shared the things that God has been doing in our life so that you could take heart and recognize He's no respecter of persons. It'll work for you. I heard a man this week, it was Mark, Pastor Mark Cower, and he says, people see the glory and they don't know the story that goes with it. And there's people that come here and they see that God has opened up a Bible school and we've got a building and all of this and they just think, well, man, there's nothing special about Andrew and so if God will do it for him, he'll do it for me. Well, that's absolutely true, 100%. But you don't know all the stuff I've gone through. You don't know all of the times that I've sat there and been studying the Word and doing things and some people want the results without doing all of the things that it takes to get the results. I'm telling you, it's as simple as what we're saying, but it is not easy. The hardest thing you will ever do in your life is unplug from the world. You know, that was Satan's temptation to Adam and Eve. They thought they were missing something. And so they had to go eat of that fruit, even though they had other thousands of other trees that had great fruit. But no, I might be missing something. And so they were tempted with knowledge, the knowledge of good and evil. And man, it'll be hard on you to unplug from this world and not just saturate yourself with all of this stuff. But I promise you, if you would put your nose in the Word and begin to renew your mind, you'll never regret it. It'll transform your life. I've missed, I don't know, I've missed five decades of American culture. I just don't know a lot of stuff. If it's not in the Bible, I don't know it. You know, Billy was teaching yesterday and I sat up there in the balcony and listened to him and I told him, I said, I think I'm getting it. This is the third time I'd heard him teach on that. And I said, it's not that I'm so dull, but it's just the things you're saying aren't in the Bible. All I've ever done is read the Bible. And he's using these terms about passive income and stuff. And I have to sit there and think because I'm, I'm not exposed to that. You know, my, my in-laws, when they were alive, we would get together with Jamie's sister and brother-in-law and we'd play Trivial Pursuit and the guys against the girls. And I know geography because I've traveled. I know some history, but man, pop culture, sports, entertainment, I don't know it. Matter of fact, I was in Mexico and I heard uh, La Bamba. Y'all know that song? And I, when I heard it, I said, Jamie, they're singing Amazing Grace because the only way I'd ever heard La Bamba was through David Hinton right here. <laughs> and I said, they're playing Amazing Grace. And she says, that's not Amazing Grace, that's La Bamba. And so anyway, we'd play Trivial Pursuit and I would just sit there like a knot on a log because I didn't know who did this, who played for what team. I didn't know anything about actors and movies. I'd I just don't know anything about that stuff. And so I was just saying, I, I said, Father, I am going to get this next question. I started drawing on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I said, I'm answering this next question. So the next question for the guys was, what magazine debuted April the 1st, 1953? And instantly I knew it was Playboy. <laughs> so the only question I got all night long... It was about Playboy, and boy, my daddy-in-law really let me have it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But honest, it was a word of knowledge. That's the way I got it. I've missed out on a lot of stuff. I really have. I've, I've missed out on being sick. I haven't been depressed in 55 years. Uh, I've missed out on just a lot of stuff, and you're going to miss a lot of stuff if you commit yourself to just totally... God, but I tell you what, I'd recommend it. And when we get to heaven, I guarantee you, you won't come up to me and say, I wish you hadn't have encouraged me to get in the word as much and stuff. You'll come up and hug me and say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because I guarantee you, it'll transform your life. Amen.
So let's ask our prayer ministers again to come down here. And especially if there's anybody here who has not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, we've already given this invitation a number of times, but don't leave here without it. I tell you, you must receive the Holy Spirit. And if, like me, maybe you've received it, but you don't speak in tongues or you aren't fluent speaking in tongues, you can't use it on a regular basis, you ought to come and let someone agree with you and pray with you because I tell you, that is necessary. And then if there's any way that we can help you get into the Word of God, that's what my whole ministry is about. All of these things, the freebies on the website, uh, all of the stuff that we have, please take advantage of it. And praise God, I believe that this has been a life transforming experience here this week. Amen. So, so let me pray with you and we're going to send you home uh, to set things on fire. Amen. So let's all stand up and let's just pray and agree together. Father, we thank you so much for loving us. Thank you, Father, that you have done so much for us that we aren't even aware of. That, Father, we don't even know just a fraction of all the good things, but thank you for the revelation that we have. And, Father, thank you for being with us this weekend. Thank you for speaking through E.W. and Jeremy and myself and every person that received the offerings and the praise and worship and just everything. Thank you for putting your super on our natural. And we just thank you, Father. We acknowledge your presence. I pray for all of my brothers here and I'm believing, Father, that they will place value on what's happened, that they will recognize that we've been in the presence of God, that they will take these truths, that they will let them become revelation knowledge to them. And we thank you and praise you in advance that as we go back to where we came from, that, Father, we are going to be a blessing to people. We're going to be changed. And, Father, it'll make a difference. And I just thank you, Father, for this time, and we bless you. We give you the glory for it, and we just praise you in advance for the difference it's going to make. And we praise you for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Praise God. So thank you all for coming. We got people down here to pray with you. Remember, we got a lot of materials out there and uh, praise God, go out and be a blessing. Have you got anything to say, Mark? I'll let Mark come up and give you a last minute instructions.